This is a revision video for Measure for Measure, which has analysis of several key character quotes. It's designed for those doing the Ella 2 Combined English Examination AS level with AQA. Because you've got to learn quotes because you're not allowed to take the book in. Which really sucks. For each character I've got two different quotes from two different sections of the play. And it's really important that you know where the quotes are from as well, so I've put those at the top. Our difference between the two Duke stages are when the Duke is as himself and when the Duke is in disguise. If we look at the first quote there, that's taken from the beginning of a long monologue, which is right at the beginning of the play. The fact that it's a very long monologue shows that he's got conversational power, people are too scared to interrupt him. Not only does the description in the play tell us that it's to an audience, but also contains many of the key characteristics of speeches to large groups of people, such as the tripartite list. Tripartite lists tend to emphasise each of the things that are being said in it, so you're thinking the nature of our people, our cities, institutions, and the terms for common justice. He's using quite low-frequency lexis here, which shows off his vast array of knowledge, and also makes people more trusting of him. They think, oh, he knows what he's talking about. The entire monologue is spoken in iambic pentameter, which shows that he is of an elevated social class in comparison to those he's speaking to. If you want him to be compared to other characters like Pompey, you'd see Pompey doesn't speak in iambic pentameter, he speaks in prose, but we've got the Duke speaking in iambic pentameter. Typically, lines spoken in iambic pentameter will be ten syllables long and they'll go between stressed and unstressed. It causes there to be a reoccurring rhythm, which sounds quite nice for the audience to listen to. A final feature of the first quote there is the use of R, the inclusive lexus, which means that A, he's sharing what he's thinking with everybody, everyone feels more involved, and he also dislikes responsibility, he says that himself he likes to share the responsibility between everybody. We've got our in the top one, and we've got us in the second quote there, and that's eloquence through the use of the royal we. If you listen to royal people, they always say, oh, we do this and we do that. And that's just, you know, a general habit of royal people, so it elevates him even further. We can feel this sort of element of authority exuding from him. In the second quote, we've also got the use of imperative. You know, I say, bid, come before us. He's saying, you know, get Angelo in front of me. This shows the instrumental power he's got due to his status. You can see he's used the word Angelo here. This means that he's introducing the character to the audience, because obviously it's going to be a bit weird if Angelo just walks on and says, Hi, I'm Angelo, because obviously all the characters would have already all known him. So Shakespeare needs to introduce each of the characters to the audience through the other characters. We can now make a direct comparison to when the Duke's in disguise and pretending to be a friar. Straight away we notice the massive difference is in prose rather than iambic pentameter, which shows he's much lower socially. So this is part of his disguise, because friars would be below Dukes in terms of the social ladder. They're still quite high, they've got religious power, but they haven't got the same authoritative power. He's using more interrogatives now, because he wants to find out lots of stuff from the people he's speaking to. He's not just disguised just for the general banter. He's disguised for a purpose. He wants to see what's going on in Vienna. And for this reason, he doesn't need to be all flowery with his speech and use low-frequency lexis. He can be much less ambiguous and use much more higher-frequency lexis, A, to show the reduction in the prestige, and B, because he wants everyone to be able to understand him so he can get what he wants from other people. He can get the information he so craves. If you want an example of instrumental power, you have it there in the use of the imperative. Tomorrow you must die, go to your knees and make ready. He's being very imperative, he's telling the person he's talking to, he's telling him, you know, this is what you need to do. He's not really leaving Claudio with very many options, he's being very, very direct. Obviously, much less ambiguous as with the previous one, because he wants to be very clear what his instructions are, and he's of less prestige, you know, he's not as prestigious when he's a friar as when he was a duke. As part of his disguise, he's used quite a religious element to his words, so he's saying, you know, go to your knees basically means, you know, pray, I think. I'm assuming that's what it means. And if you look through lots of his other speech, I can only have a few examples for each character here, but I think the Duke says heavens at some point. He makes a lot of biblical references because he's pretending to be a friar. It all adds to this disguise. And also, if we look here, you know, you must die. He's not being very respectful of Claudio's negative face. Maybe he's thinking, you know, I don't have to be because I'm not myself, I'm pretending to be somebody. Nobody's going to judge me for this because nobody's going to know it's me. Now we're going to look at the beautiful Isabella and we're going to make a comparison when we, she's with two different men. The first man she wants something from and the second man wants something from her. Isabella supposedly has the power to move men. And here's two examples when she's trying to persuade Angelo to let her brother live. Straight away we've got loads and loads of persuasive techniques, including inclusive lexis, we, our. 
This immediately makes Angelo feel more involved and the audience as well feel more involved in the unfolding situation, makes him feel slightly more empathetic towards Claudio intentionally. I mean, that's what her intentions are. They don't really work as Angelo still orders the death of Claudio, but she tried, she tried. Then we've got our binary pairs. I mean, I couldn't be bothered to type up the whole of the, like, she's got a mini monologue here. I didn't want to have the whole of that here because it's much, much too much to learn. But there's more along the whole theme of, you know, great men may jester of saints, is wishing them, but in the less foul profanation. So we've got our binary pair and our contrast here between the great men and then the less. Essentially, Isabella is trying to highlight the unfairness within Vienna. We've also got another binary pair that I've not put in here. It's to do with uh, captains and then other sailors being able to swear or not, I think. It could be deemed that she is subtly respecting Angelo's positive face, because she's subtly saying, you know, great men. She's not, she's not saying, you know, you're great, although she does do that quite a bit in the scene. She probably begs it off him. But she's subtly respecting his positive face, which puts him into a much better mood, and therefore he's more likely to agree with her demands. Obviously, she puts him into a bit too much of a good mood, and he ends up wanting to get with her. You can't see it from that small extract there, but her speech is gradually lengthening, so when she came in, her speech bits were very, very short. I mean, she said stuff like, Oh, but severe law, I had a brother then, heaven keep your honour. Very, very short stuff, whereas this bit here, this little monologue he's giving, they get longer and longer and longer. And this, I suppose you could say she's gaining a more conversational power. She's also speaking in iambic pentameter, because she's quite a well-spoken person from what we've heard from all the other characters. She's well-spoken, so that's the way she would speak. It also sounds nicer in iambic pentameter, and thus, when he's listening to her, he might be thinking, you know, this girl sounds like she's got some sense, she's not some random person. Looking at that second quote there, it's very, very short and yet powerful. It's monosyllabic. The words, each of the words has much more impact. You know, must he needs die. You're thinking, oh my god, must he needs die. It's an interrogative. It demands an answer. Angelo doesn't really have a choice unless he wants to, you know, walk away, which he probably won't do. He must answer the question, which, you know, she's basically forcing him to give an answer. I mean, whether it's a question, she, you know, the answer she likes or not, if it isn't, she can argue back, and if it is, then job's done. Also, that there contrasts a bit more with some of her uh, more ambiguous speech features, like in the, the bit above, her speech is very, very ambiguous, whereas Musty Needs Die is not ambiguous at all. Angelo and Isabella are both on exactly the same page, they both know exactly what they're talking about. She's trying to evade the risk of confusion. Maybe in her head she's decided that her flowery speech hasn't really worked, hasn't done the trick, and she's thinking, you know, maybe I have to go back to basics and try very, very basic questions, and try, try, try to save my brother's life. And then we've got this whole different side to Isabella when she's with her brother, and I think this quote there, that's very, very cruel, because there's the illusion of the preferred response. She's saying, you know, all comforts are really good, you know, this is a really good thing I can tell you now. And, you know, he's thinking, yeah, that's great, but that's not true at all. Then it's got this almost black humour sense here, it's almost ironic, where she's like, yeah, Lord Angelo wants you to be a swift ambassador to heaven, which obviously isn't what Claudio wants to hear, but Isabella's trying to twist it to make him think, oh, look, I'm getting some good news here, but it's actually terrible news. In a sense, she's sort of hedging as well, you know, she's like, most good, most good indeed. She's waiting a bit to deliver the bad news. She doesn't want to give it straight away. She's trying to settle him in a bit into it. You could also say that the repetition of most good builds suspense, you know. Maybe it's for emphasis or maybe it's for suspense. You're thinking, oh, my God, what is she going to say to him? Is she going to tell him the truth? This is for the audience. It's a dramatic feature here. And finally, the use of religious lexis makes it slightly more persuasive, obviously. We all know Isabella's come from a nunnery. And if she's using religious lexis, maybe she's saying the words of God, maybe she's saying something good and true and holy. So the word heaven, we think, all religious. And that's one thing that doesn't really change with Isabella throughout the whole play. She's religious in all of the scenes. I mean, there's nothing in those scenes of Angelo there that's religious, but if you looked in the scene itself, you can find so many religious references all through the play. And she's very trusting in the friar. Remember that friar that comes up to her, Friar Peter, is it? And they, her and Mariana, they both put their entire trust in this friar. And also Duke Friar, they put a lot of trust in him as well. And then we're going to come on to this second bit with Isabella and Claudio, which is in the same scene, but it's after she's told him, you know, you're going to have to die. And he's like, oh no, I don't want to die. Get raped by Angelo. She's like, oh, you beast. Oh, faithless coward. Oh, dishonest wretch. So there you are. That's three... Um, insults there, a tripartite list of insults which has much greater impact. We've also got these cataphoric adjectives which increase the power of each of the words, you know, you're thinking faithless coward, dishonest wretch. In a sense there's almost a bit of contrast there because dishonest and faithless, they each started as something good, so faith and like honesty, but then they've been made negative, so you could draw something from that maybe. 
her use of you, well, she says thou actually, but, you know, will thou be made a man out of my vice? It means you. She's saying, you know, makes it much more direct towards Claudio. It demands an answer. Claudio's there thinking, oh my god, what the hell? And also this use here of the rhetorical question. I mean, is it a rhetorical question or does she actually want an answer? It makes everybody think. It makes Claudia think. It makes the audience think. The audience think a lot more deeply about the situation. I mean, on the back of my book, the first, like, um, part of the blurb says, in the hope of saving her brother's life, should a woman submit to rape? This is the question that Shakespeare's asking his audience right now. This is the question he wants them to answer. Now we're going to move on to the evil Angelo. In some of Angelo's first line is, always obedient to your grace's will, I come to know your pleasure. He uses a subordinate clause and it's also the first thing he thinks about is himself. This shows that he could potentially be a very, very self-centred character. A comparison we're going to make for Angelo is Angelo when he's alone, his private self, and Angelo when he's with others, his public self. All of this is done in a soliloquy because he's by himself, so there's no one... To speak to and it's basically the chance for the audience to get an insight into Angelo's real thoughts so that builds sort of dramatic tension because the audience has the knowledge of stuff that the other characters don't have the audience know what Angelo's true feelings are and throughout this whole passage we have this extended metaphor for sex which shows you know it's just how ashamed he is he doesn't want to acknowledge that he's like in lust with Isabella he's just trying to keep it hidden and he's using negative lexis here you know raise the sanctuary and pitch her over there to have sewers and um feces, that sort of thing. He believes sex is bad, he's trying to have loads of negative connotations with the word sex. A sanctuary is a religious place and the idea of raising a sanctuary is essentially destroying something religious and the idea of sex in at the time was if you had sex and you weren't married that was against religion, so essentially destroying the religion here. We've got this question here, it's a rhetorical question, it makes the audience feel more involved in Angelo's thoughts. It allows the audience this chance of insight into Angelo's head, but it allows them to get into it themselves, so they can see things through his eyes, they can tell exactly what he's thinking. And we end here with a repetition of fi, which means shame. Oh, fi, 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 has a much greater impact than the audience. The audience understand how ashamed Angelo is of his own feelings. Moving on to our second quote here, we've got the word cunning, and there's lots and lots of different sexual lexis throughout the... Um, soliloquy and apparently cunning is a type of sexual like because obviously nowadays it doesn't mean something sexual apparently back in the day it did and that just adds the whole theme of sexuality throughout this whole soliloquy essentially the entire soliloquy is us being able to have an insight into Angelo's sexual desires we've got the juxtaposition here of enemy and saint obviously they're total opposites we've got the compar the contrast between them so it emphasizes both of them it adds to the whole effect you know it's saying the change you know the enemy and the saint, they're in the same person. So he self-describes as a saint, he believes in his own morality, but then, you know, he thinks that Isabella is the enemy. He's treating Isabella as the enemy and himself as the saint. So we see this totally different side to Angelo. It's very self-superior still. He still believes in his own morality. He thinks it's injured, like everyone's out to trick him rather than he's just lusting her. Lusting her, lusting after her. And essentially this entire soliloquy here is an extended metaphor for his lust for Isabel. And this is such a massive contrast to how he acts when he's with others, such as in Act 2, Scene 1, when he's with Aeschylus. He's saying, you know, it is one thing to be tempted, Aeschylus, another thing to fall. He's saying, you know, just because different people have these ideas of lust, it's a totally different thing to actually commit the sexual act itself which obviously is very different to when we get into Angelo's head and he's thinking, you know, I'm going to tell Isabella that I'm going to have sex with her and then free her brother. It's totally different here. We've got this massive contrast in Angelo's actions. The word Escola shows us that this is direct address. His words seem much more powerful because they're directly addressed to Escola. He's almost accusing Escola of falling for these sexual temptations. And whilst in the soliloquy from before, you know, he was using metaphors, you know, let's raise the sanctuary and picture evils here. Here we've got very, very, very straight talking Angelo I mean there's no ambiguity here his meaning is very clear he just does not want to face this risk of being accused of lechery or being accused of having sex with someone or having lustful thoughts because that's totally against the way he wants his his public persona to be portrayed obviously this is exactly the same as the Duke as later on in the Duke when he's speaking to Lucio and the Lucio is saying you know you'd mouth off with a beggar or something. The Duke is very, very quick to defend himself and say, you know, no, I don't think the Duke was like that. 
And we've also got this idea of moral distinction. He exudes morality. We think straight away and see, look, this person wants to be seen to be moral. And this is direct opposite to when he's by himself. So if you want to make a comparison with Angelo, I think definitely you want to make a comparison between how moral he is when he is with other people and his immor immorality when he is by himself. Looking at the second quote now, Sir, he must die. Very monosyllabic, meaning the words are all very more powerful. We've got slight respect there with the Sir, respecting his positive face. It tends to mean you want something, because what he wants from this Aeschylus person is he wants Aeschylus to agree with him. And yet he's still showing this commanding attitude, this commanding nature of it within him, is by saying, you know, he must die. It's an imperative. Must is also a deontic modal verb, I believe, which means it's very forceful, very strong. He's essentially showing off his instrumental power and he wants to get stuff done. Very short, very simple. Again, it's all about power. Angelo's statements, his utterances when he's with other people are all about exerting authority over them and showing, you know, he is higher up in hierarchy. The big exception to this would be the final version of Angelo, which is the Angelo we see at the end, who's accepting of his fault and is simply trying to avoid lengthy public humiliation. Lucio, or Lucio, or however you want to pronounce it, Lucio's character really does not change. As the play progresses, he stays very sexually provocative, very impolite, and his main role within the play is as a rake, as a libertine, someone that's, you know, very sexually lax and provides humour for the audience. The two versions of Lucio I've chosen to get quotes for are Lucio when he's with his mates in the pub, or in the brothel, or wherever they are, and Lucio when he's with Stranger, who is in this case a friar, and it essentially it's actually the Duke disguised as a friar. Straight away with Lucio in the first quote, we've got this whole element of black humour, the idea that sexually transmitted disease are funny. And essentially he has got no moral boundary. I mean, all of his mates are relatively lax. I mean, at this point, they're joking about syphilis and stuff like this. But you can see that Lucio's lines, if you look at his utterances, they are longer than others because he is a respected gentleman, which is rather amusing, really quite ironic, given his very sexual nature. Lucio's words are always flooded with jokes. And here we have the alliteration with Madame Mitigation, which emphasises what he's saying and could essentially be a joke in itself because we've got the word mitigation, which means to make something less painful and we could be saying that Madame Overdone, who he's referring to here, her presence in Vienna makes it more like less painful for everyone that's in there because they can all have sex. I mean it's legal but they're all doing it and thus it's reducing the pain for them of having to refrain from any acts of a sexual nature. Then if you look at the second quote there, Quite a lot of it is low frequency Lexus, which reflects his gentlemanly status. So obviously he is someone of a higher class. Obviously he's not top class, but he's not one of those povs off the street. He's not Pompey or someone like that. He is of a decent class. He is a gentleman. So we've got that whole idea of him trying to almost appear to be greater than others by using this low frequency Lexus. But then we've still got this informal Lexus because thou, with back in the day, obviously nowadays we think, ooh, thou's really posh. But back in the day, thou was actually really informal. And... So we get this idea that he's with his friends, he's with mates, and they're all there having a laugh and he probably wants to amuse them. And he tries to amuse them by using similes, which are humorous to make the words stand out. So we've got this whole idea of like the sanctimonious pirate, so he's drawing comparison to his friend as being like a sanctimonious pirate, essentially banter in the pub with your mates. He's being quite cynical as well, which shows this cynical side to his character, like when he's speaking to the Duke, or he thinks it's a friar, he's being very cynical about the Duke. Straight away on the right with the stuff with Lucio, there's this immediate irony of everything he's saying because obviously he's talking about the Duke, but he, he's actually talking to the Duke. Lucio's speech is flooded with all loads and loads and loads of metaphors for sex, which is obviously hilarious at the time. All these Shakespearean fans, they found this stuff absolutely hilarious because it wasn't the stuff they got back home because obviously at the time you had to abstain from anything of a sexual nature. But then we've also got Lucio using this negative imagery. So he's whether he's trying to slag off the Duke or whether he's, like all the other characters in the play, got this idea that sex is something bad. Because you know when, um, who was it, Angelo was talking about, he was talking about raising the sanctuary. That was his metaphor for sex. They're all using these negative imagery in the same sort of context with sex. They're putting them together. 
If you look here when he's talking to the Duke, he's actually using very covert prestige, which is quite divergent from the Friar, who's using more overt prestige. When I say Friar, I mean Duke Friar. Just go along with whatever I say. And you see those bits there in brackets. I reckon they're extra words and they're there to build tension. Because the audience is listening in and every small amount that Lucio is saying, they're thinking, oh my god, Lucio, what the hell are you doing? I think all these extra bits, they're building up more and more tension because the audience is ready for this Duke to go mad, which obviously he does do at the end when he has a massive go at Lucio. So I think it just builds up this whole air of dramatic tension within the scene. Moving on now to our second quote, a little more lengthy to lecture. Straight away we've got our alliteration there, emphasising the words, this is what's important to Lucio here. Obviously Lucio's being very open with this uh, religious stranger. It's probably being slightly disrespectful towards the friar's beliefs. It's like going into a church and saying Jesus wasn't real. This sort of speech would be quite offensive, I think, to a friar. But... In the same way, you know, Lucio is acting exactly the same as he would have acted with his friends. So in a sense, we've got this idea that he simply doesn't change. He's bragging about his sexual promiscuity straight away with this random stranger. He's essentially a character which doesn't change and he's simply there for the purpose of making the audience laugh. If you want to make a comparison here, you might want to make a comparison between Lucio and then people like Pompey and Elbow. Whilst the audience is laughing with Lucio, they're laughing at Pompey and um, what the other guy is, Elbow. Which could be a reason for their names, like Lucio is just a relatively normal name, but then Pompey Bum and Elbow, they're both body parts and body humour was really big at the time, so you could say they've been named that way so the audience knows they're the characters to laugh at. Moving on now to Claudio, who fulfills the role of the tragic hero in Measure for Measure, and what I thought I'd do is compare Claudio with two characters. Lucio, who's his mate, and Isabella, his sister. So the scene with Lucio is in Act 1, Scene 2, and I think they're on the street and Lucio's gone out to see what's going on and he's trying to work out why Claudio's going to prison and stuff. So he asks him, you know, what have you done? And Claudio says, but to speak of would offend again. And then Lucio asks, you know, what is it, murder? No. Lechery? Call it so. They're very, very short, blunt, to the point answers. There's absolutely no mitigation, which... It's almost impolite given that Lucio's a friend. It could be because he is ashamed of his sexual deviance. He's quite monosyllabic. Maybe that shows that he doesn't really want to talk and he's very reluctant to talk about the stuff he's done because in that day and age it was very frowned upon to have sexual relations outside of marriage. And then below when he is talking about sex he describes it as their most mutual entertainment which is basically a euphemism for sex showing you know further shame about it. All of Lucio's speech really here is done in iambic pentameter which shows his status and he's also got more of it Lexis than Lucio. This could be because he has higher morals than Lucio, he's got a higher moral stance and stuff like that. In a sense like, I suppose you could say that he's almost trying to shift the blame, he says our most mutual entertainment which is inclusive of, I suppose it's basically himself and Juliet I think her name was? But don't 100% me on that. That might be the one from the Romeo and Juliet play. Julietta. That was close. Also, he has here the intensifier most, if we're looking very closely at the Lexus here, which essentially emphasises the words mutual entertainment, which stands for sex. He's emphasising the sex in there so all the audience can tell exactly what Claudio's done. And straight away, if we look at how he speaks to Isabella, there's this massive change in Lexus and just the way he speaks all together so you know sweet sister straight away here we've got our assonance which emphasizes the closeness to the relationship he's trying to emphasize the word sister so you know sweet sister so he's a trying to flatter her positive face because he wants something and b he's trying to emphasize you know they are related they are close it's you know the same blood running through both their veins because he wants her to recognize how close they are that she might give up something for him in this case her body also it makes the words much more powerful we also have here the imperative, so let me live. That's also alliteration there with the let and the live, so he's trying to emphasise life. But with the imperative, he's being very demanding of his sister, which shows how demanding he is of life. He wants to keep life. And this scene is much more interesting when it's juxtaposed with the bit he's just had, the conversation he just had with the Duke, where he said, you know, I'll sue to be rid of life. I want to, life to be over. I want to go to heaven. Just quite interesting the way that Claudio's character changes depending on who he's speaking to and what he wants. And if we look here at the word me, me is obviously 
referring to himself, which shows that he might be a self-centred person. You know, these intentions here in this conversation with Isabella, they're very self-centred. He wants to live and he doesn't care what she has to give up for this to happen. So you could show that maybe Shakespeare was trying to provide the audience with a more balanced character, so he's showing Claudio's faults as well as his strengths. I mean, typically a tragic hero will have a major fault that lets them down. And I'd say here, Claudio, you could say it's his selfishness. You could say, you know, it's the fact that he was just desperate to have sex with Juliet. If you look at the words in, I suppose, both of them, really, very, very high-frequency Lexus, there's no deviation. He knows what he wants, and he's just trying the very straightforward way of getting it. It's basically the opposite to Isabella, so if you're writing about this, you might want to do a contrast between him and Isabella. So when Isabella's talking to Angelo, she uses that very long, elaborate thing where she talks about great men jesting with saints, whilst nonetheless it's foul profanation. You could make that comparison there. Also, the exclamation there, we've got the, what's his face, an exclamation mark which shows how desperate he is for his life. So the audience may sympathise with him slightly because they think, you know, if I was in that situation, I would want my life. But you've got to remember at the time, the audience would have been very anti-sex. So what Claudio did was very wrong, although it was something that was done very, very commonly. Lots of people used brothels as well, which would probably be deemed even worse. Looking at the second quote there on the right, we've got, Now, sister, what's the comfort? It's an initiator. It starts the conversation. That's what's needed. You know, that's Shakespeare trying to make the conversation seem more realistic. It's an interrogative, because essentially that's a posh word of saying question, which demands a response. So it's been quite forceful here. Again, we have sister, sister and brother spread throughout what he's saying, because it reminds us of their relation, and also it reminds Isabella of their relation, how close they are. In this conversation, he tends to have power. If you look at what he's saying, he's got quite long bits of speech. He's got that massive monologue here, where he's just saying how much he loves life. Let's see if I can find it... It's the bit where he uses a lot of pathetic fallacies. He talks about fiery floods and thick ribbed ice. Essentially, he's talking about hell and how much he's afraid of death and thus wants to live. So, yes, he does hold conversational power due to his gender, and a posh word for that is patriarchal paradigm. Paradigm? Don't know how you pronounce that, but that's a nice posh word. And finally, we have the expectations here. Straight away, he expects his sister to have brought good news, which again shows the character change. Beforehand, he wanted just to die when he was talking to the Friar Duke. Now he's asking his sister for comforts. He wants to live, showing expectations here of her. This could almost build up a sense of tension within the audience because they're watching and they're thinking, ooh, look, he's changed. So that's dramatic tension if you're looking for a dramatic technique to weave in here. Pompey! We're going to compare him when he's with his friends and then when he's with senior people, people that he should be looking up to and respecting. First quote there, I just find it hilarious every time. It makes me laugh and most humour for Shakespeare would only appeal to Shakespearean people, but that is quite funny. So straight away here we've got the light comic relief. Pompey essentially fulfils the role of the clown. So we've got the double entendre here, you know, what's he doing? Ooh, a woman, ha! Ah. So we've got the extended metaphor, you know, groping for trout in a peculiar river, which is again humorous for the audience. Sexual innuendo, humorous, humorous, humorous. Everything he's saying is essentially humorous. Even the short sentences, if you've got a long long-winded sentence it's very hard for the audience to keep up and understand it so they won't find it funny but if you've got something short and simple you know the best jokes are really short why did the chicken cross the road to get to the other side absolutely hilarious no it isn't but it could be hilarious and it's very short so essentially all the best jokes are very very short and finally look here at the prestige it's very covert, which is he's of a lower class than the other people. Even his friends, like Lucio, he's of a much lower class than them. So when he didn't understand what Lucio was saying in, I think it was Act 3, Scene 2, when he only responds to Lucio when Lucio simply gives a very simple sentence, you know, art going to prison. When we look at the second quote there, it looks better when you have it in the context and you've read the whole play, but it stands out because it's in prose, whereas the m majority of the play is in iambic pentameter because Pompey's of a lower class, so all the higher class people tend to speak in iambic pentameter, whereas Pompey speaks in a much lower, um, lower class manner, so in prose. He's being respectful of Madame Mitigations. That's not her name. What's her name? Mistress Overdone, that's the one. Mr. Soberdon's positive face by using, you know, the word good, good counsellors. So he's trying to be really polite to her simply because he wants to keep his job. Again, we have the simple language which shows his lack of intelligence. So the vast majority of what he's saying is very high frequency access. Pompey with friends, act two, scene one. This is the bit, I think he's talking to Aeschylus and he's explaining the story of essentially what I think happened was 
Elbow, I think it was Elbow's wife, went into a brothel and got mistaken for a prostitute or something like that. The scene is very confusing to read until you realise all of the different, you know, innuendos and metaphors they're using. Like, I didn't realise for ages that prunes were prostitutes, so I was just so confused as to what was going on. But anyway, he starts, he's being very, very respectful of the positive face. Sir, honour. It's because he wants something, he basically doesn't want to be punished. He wants to stay clear of punishments, he wants to walk free, which I think he does in the end, actually. He says, you know, next time we'll whip you, but this time you can go off, I believe. So, you know, he's showing his respect for authority there. Then we have this extended metaphor, all the stuff that's very confusing for us now. Back in the day, they'd have known all these, you know, slang prunes and stuff, and they'd have found it absolutely hilarious. Also, it's interesting to see the comparison to when he's with his seniors and when he's talking to his friends. When he's with his friends, if you look at the top quote there, very short, slick sentences, whereas with his seniors, he uses quite long monologues when he's telling his stories. It's amusing for the audience, but it also could be, if you're looking deeply at his character, maybe he just doesn't want to stop talking because he wants to get his whole story out before he gets cut off. Maybe you can see that. He's trying to get conversational power when he clearly doesn't have it due to his status, but he still remains relatively similar to when he's with his friends. Very funny, quite sexual, making quite a lot of bad jokes. Again, with the second quote at the bottom there, being very respectful of Aeschylus's public face. And he's got a quite a big difference here between his public front down there. So we look at here, we've got, I thank your worship for our good counsel, that's his public front. And his private front is very sarcastic. You know, it's quite humorous here, you know. Lol, I'm totally not going to follow your advice. We have the alliteration, so follow, flesh, fortune. Makes the words have more impact. So we see here straight away flesh and fortune. Flesh is something they'd probably associate with sexual needs, and fortune would be associated with fortune. <laughs> Couldn't think of a good point there. This is sort of almost building tension. You know, the audience thinking, is Pompey going to obey Aeschylus? Is he going to go and have sex? I wrote an essay on Pompey the other day. It's not too hard to write, to be honest, because you can say quite a bit about him, but it's not an easy character, so I don't think they're going to bring him up in the first few years, definitely. I think that'd be quite a nasty question to give you off the cuff. That's all of the major characters in Measure for Measure. I've got quotes here for Mistress Overdone, the Provost guy, and Mariana, so if anyone wants quotes and analysis of them, just comment or something, I can email them to you. I just couldn't be bothered to do you know, talking about each one, because the chances of them coming up are more slim than the chances of Pompey coming up. This is the first year they're doing it on the course, so I'd hope that it's going to be a relatively main character, so maybe someone like Angelo or Isabella. They might skirt around the really main ones, I suppose, like the Duke. But it's going to be someone relatively major, hopefully. And I just pray it isn't a theme, because that would be a total nightmare. Anyway, I hope this video has helped and you've got some lovely quotes in your head. Have a lovely day and best of luck in the exam. Bye.